So please continue to add questions, um, and I'll try to use those that we have uh, available to us. Um, uh, first, I, I think this one is for uh, Bettina. Um, uh, the, the question kind of broadly is, it seems the technology use in aging care lags behind clear need um, uh, in both the U.S. and in Norway, although the government has made a major investment in Norway. Um, what are each of your thoughts or, uh, uh, about how we can catalyze this and how we can move forward um, in bringing technology to both abet care as well as to uh, improve diagnostics and our approach uh, to taking care of older adults? It's to me. Um, th uh, thank you. I, I is, uh, think that um, um, collaboration, international collaboration, is one of the important uh, issues we need in Norway. We actually uh, interviewed people with dementia and we asked them um, about um, their preferences. And they said, we want to stay at home, but we do not want to have this kind of innovation or peeping devices. So uh, we have to develop more appropriate, innovative approaches which are uh, unobtrusive and hidden and develop the, the right information uh, regarding these people. And there we need more international collaboration. Keith, you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. I, I would agree with the, uh, the collaboration aspect. I think that, um, that there are venues to do that, including one like this one, for example. Um, another thing I think is um, uh, validation testing. I was really um, pleased to see in Antonio's presentation all the work that they've put into the validation of this um, instrument because part of what happens with technology is it changes so rapidly that we can barely keep up with the validation studies. And so I just wanted to congratulate you um, on that. And I think that it's going to go a long way toward um, increasing um, adoption of these technologies. I'd just like to add, you know, flexible funding for different types of services uh, that they, I don't know whether it's working or not, but the, um, It's working. You're good. The, um, you know, we've been so tethered to a fee-for-service kind of face-to-face -face way of delivering these services that I think what all these presentations showed is that we need to kind of get beyond that and hopefully figure out ways to finance these sorts of, of much more scalable and, and potentially more effective population-based interventions. Only uh, one um, um, issue in addition, we need the collaboration with the companies. Earlier, we were not able to work uh, together with companies in Norway, but the government now opens for this uh, because uh, we have to collaborate, the researchers, the companies, and the public. Yeah, and I'd agree with that as well. There's so much complexity in terms of actually commercializing these tests. There's so much of the privacy, the regulatory aspect. I don't know how you would do it outside of a company. Um, Can you so speak I think a little bit to the challenges you've had in commercializing <laughs> something that, you know. A, Where do I, I mean, begin? I mean, you described a test that's familiar to all of us. Yes. Um, and now you're using artificial intelligence to make it have greater value um, and to, frankly, bring testing much more easily to a very large population. It would seem to be exciting to almost anyone looking at it. What are the barriers you face so far in adoption? Yeah, so we purposefully chose a test that would be familiar to help with adoption. Um, so, so I think we had a little bit of a smoother path compared to other tests that are completely not based on traditional tests. Um, but it, it's, it's just such a complex environment. Anytime you have a regulation by the FDA, you know, that's, that's a bar that you have to always um, be on top of. Again, that, that privacy and security aspect, all the changing regulations there. Um, and then, you know, getting getting funding to develop these things because that validation costs a lot of money. <laughs> and, and, you know, private funding is great, but then also government funding to support these things I think is super important. Just to uh, 
uh, elucidate, I mean, basically, you have to go through a process of continually raising funds. So as mm -hmm. frustrating as it feels to be able to apply for grants at the same time when you're burning cash, investing in a new technology, having to convince a group of strangers that there's going to be an ROI and substantial growth and a multiple in terms of return on investment is, is pretty challenging. One question that was specifically on the diagnostic side for you just to, is the DCT clock sensitive to repeated testing over time, um, uh, and is there any problem in terms of that kind of learning uh, longitudinally? Yeah, so we do have some uh, test retest reliability data. I apologize, I didn't present it today. Um, we specifically looked at repeat testing with a one to four week period and found good uh, repeatability. Now, someone asked me just, just last week, oh, well, what if I give it once a week for you know a year? Okay, <laughs> I don't have that data, I apologize. But we do have some, um, some good re test retest reliability. Um, and we do have pharma partners who are currently using the technology who test uh, almost monthly. So hopefully once those tests read out, once those trials read out, we'll be able to um, show more. So th there's a, a set of questions that uh, I think Karen's uh, data that you described, Steve, start to address. What are the issues around um, uh, older adult populations and their willingness to use digital technologies overall? How willing are they to adopt? them to overall management. I'd be interested in extrapolating from that brief experience you described and then for each of you to kind of give a sense. And Keith, as you hear in the association from members and their families about the thoughts in that regard. Yeah, we actually, we've had questions in the past about older people, some of which actually have paranoid disorders. You know, would they, how would they feel about this? And I can tell you in the first study that I described for you, um, we actually did a did a pre-post study uh, where we, uh, with a weightless control, and we had only so many of these devices. When we took these devices away from the people that had them previously, they cried. Um, they, I mean, they, they literally felt like they had a guardian angel that was checking in on them, where they were so isolated and, demarg and marginalized in our culture to have this idea of a remote person device that actually had a person connected. And that's an interesting question here, too, is how much human. But... We actually had the nurse install the device, sit down with the person, have one face-to-face, -face, just one. They always knew that she or he was back behind this thing and a real person was text messaging. So I think part of this issue around, perhaps at least in my experience with older adults, the idea that the, that the device is linked to a human, same thing with the peer support, for us has been the seller. Uh, that the device alone often, you know, I think by itself perhaps would not scale or be accepted, but that's just our own experience with people with mental illness. Keith, uh, what are you hearing around the association from consumers and their families? Yeah, I don't think we give um, older adults enough credit for their um, willingness to adopt new technology. I think that um, uh, it's ease of use and convenience, I think. If the ease of use and convenience is there, they will adopt it. I, I think we all know people probably who don't do very well with their um, desktop computers, but just love their iPad and their smartphone. So I think the easier the technology gets to use, um, the more um, uptake we're going to see. Um, I, I also think that they're very willing to share their data and personal information uh, as well. We did a fairly large um, clinical study of amyloid PET imaging called the IDEAS study and 18 million people, or sorry, 18,000 people, 18 million, 18,000 people um, got uh, amyloid PET scans as part of this. And as you can imagine, there are a number of add-on studies for that. And um, uh, there were four. And the, uh, so we had to call all these people and say, hey, will you do this study? Will you do that study? Will you do the other study that are add-ons? And the one that people were most likely to say yes to uh, was the one where they shared DNA samples, which surprised us quite a bit because we thought, well, that's, you know, you're giving us your DNA. Uh, but we think that the reason that was the one that people were most likely to say yes to is because all they had to do literally was spit it in a tube and put it in the mail. So it was easy. So the easier and more convenient we can make these technologies, the more I think people are going to take them up, and, and older people are no different than younger people in that regard. Uh, you, you were actually showing, Bettina, at the end, uh, a woman who was sitting in what looked like a nursing home bed um, and using a tablet. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the use of those technologies uh, and the patients in the nursing home in particular? Um, actually, no. We do not have so many uh, devices or innovation in nursing homes. But um, we are not talking, in, in our research, we are not talking about 
uh, really the people who are 90 plus, but we are more talking about our generation, that we have to be prepared. Uh, in Europe uh, today, we have 10 million people with dementia, and this will double in the next 15 years. Or, for instance, in Japan, they have 10 million people uh, with dementia today. Uh, and the, one of the main problems uh, may be uh, loneliness, social isolation, depression, then leading to a dementia. And I, I have the feeling that we cannot choose. We have to go on with this development, whether they like it or not, but it's about us, I think. And, uh, of course, it's about uh, prevention as well uh, and lifestyle um, recommendations, as we heard today. It's not only that we focus on this, uh, these people with dementia today, but uh, how can we prevent dementia and our children? Steve, uh, you were starting to address it just a bit um, in terms of the human component. Uh, did you see any uh, differences uh, regarding ethnicity and the preference for human coaching rather than digital coaching, uh, particularly in terms of medical illness? We haven't looked at that. It's a great question. I, I don't know. So I, 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 don't, know I don't know who you can give credit to as a third author on this one, but we'll try to find that out. Um, but it was a yeah, I, I don't know. What, what I can say is that, is that this issue of implementation science and the adapting delivery for different ethnicities is really important. And so what we did, we did find early on some of our materials, we, we, we looked at them and we went, oh my goodness, we can't believe we made this error. Everybody looks like me in this, uh, not white hair, but uh, the same color skin. And so this idea of thinking about how to uh, adapt um, technology so that uh, people see individuals and relate to people that look like and think like them and they can identify with is just couldn't be more important. So I think this issue of cultural adaptation outside of the personal, but also the, the things that, that are important to that particular race or ethnicity or gender or LGBT, what, whatever it is, um, those things are really important and we need to think more about them. T Tony, you described pretty successfully the, uh, a, the use of AI to be able to take what was a, has been an analog tool um, uh, and start to give it higher and higher degrees of utility in that uh, its specificity and sensitivity actually exceeded uh, ordinary pencil and paper and other tests that are used, um, not quite as gold standards, but certainly as measures against the gold standard, which remains within the challenge. Our gold standards remain challenging um, in psychiatry uh, and in behavioral disorders. Can you talk about the challenges and the pitfalls in using AI and what your concerns are and how the data are curated and ultimately how uh, machine learning and AI um, uh, have to be uh, both on, on the one hand carefully used and how you look at the opportunity with the kind of excitement you presented? I think the quality of the data sets that goes in is really key. Um, it's definitely a field where you have to really start with high quality data to get high quality output. And so for us, you know, having those, those curated data sets was, was huge and having a big enough end that, that you're really looking through the noise and finding those specific aspects of cognitive impairment because if you're thinking about drawing behavior, there's so much variability. My handwriting is different than your handwriting. You know, I draw my sevens with a line through them and you don't. You have to be able to weed out those, the, the noise to get to those true indicators of cognitive state. And so I think that a large data set and the quality of the data set is, is hugely important. Keith, you know, um, Steve, uh, actually, I think uh, one of the initial presentations in description uh, about our patient populations and the use of digital technology raised the notion of people's fear of sharing their data, privacy as it related to those data, um, and that in people with psychiatric symptoms, somehow intensifying their being phobic to use um, uh, digital materials. C can you tell me what the association is doing in thinking about privacy overall, about people owning their own data on the one hand, but also in protecting privacy as we have more in the, more in the way of digital applications, surveillance data, um, uh, and other analytics which are pretty critical to being able to make some of the implementation changes we're describing? Yeah, great question, and I think that um, you know, we're really just on uh, the cusp of starting some of that work now. Uh, we have developed over the past couple of years a strategy for working with um, health systems, and I think that our work with health systems will um, uh, inform uh, a lot more of that work as we move forward, um, especially around, you know, privacy um, issues. 
Have any of you have to d deal with privacy issues? I assume in, you, in all the human subjects work that you're doing, um, as well as the commercialization, um, have there been specific nuanced issues that have prevented you or created challenges as you've tried to do this implementation? Uh, to include people with advanced dementia in clinical trials is really hard. And we recently uh, got uh, the new regulation, EU regulation, that we are able to, in one way, to include, but also to protect these people for unnecessary uh, or meaningless uh, research and uh, to uh, protect the data. So this is labor intensive, but on the other side, by this regulation, we are able to do our research on these people, and this is very helpful. So the uh, organization uh, and delivery of care uh, and access to psychiatric and other services has been, is referenced in everybody's presentation one way or the other. Um, uh, the growth of the population, the growth of disability associated with it, the size of the problem, um, the dollar figures which are daunting. I think if you uh, probably add uh, each of the first or third slides from every presentation over the course of the next two days, we'll have the gross domestic product of the United States that'll be identified in three or four diseases that um, we uh, are trying to work on uh, uh, overall. How do you see, um, and maybe Steve, you can start because you're talking about an area in which there's notoriously poor integration of care. You know, with uh, our patients with severe uh, mental illness, uh, get terrible primary care that obviously is a contribution to um, a harrowing life expectancy that um, I think you know we need to measure all care by the worst possible outcomes and that is a just an unacceptable number how do you, you start to talk a little bit about data being used in patient centered medical homes how do you see the ability to use data helping us to reorganize care its accessibility uh, and patient populations that we can serve I mean, I, th I think, you know, there's all these models around integrating mental health and primary care, both bringing mental health into primary care and bringing medical care into mental health. And, and even though a number of us held hands a number of years ago and did this 10 by 10 initiative, this idea that in 10 years we would increase the life expectancy of people with mental illness in 10 years, we completely failed. So I think one of the issues is that it's not good enough just to integrate care it's probably not sufficient to, to just deliver care. We have to get upstream in terms of prevention. But also, I think, as you alluded, we need to figure out how to use more intelligent systems and data to target people and to not just have single tools, but actually segment uh, interventions and personalize care around people's genetic as well as social determinants of health and, and begin to use really much more, take care of the, use the data that we have to actually deliver targeted interventions that people really need at the right time and in the, and in the right place. And then track that over time to see whether we're actually hitting the nail on the head. Uh, and then finally, we need to think about, again, moving away from uh, financing that is based on, uh, on procedures or on visits and, and, and really have honest to goodness value-based based care and hold, hold systems accountable, particularly for marginalized and high-risk, high-cost patients like the ones we're talking about here. Other comments about organizational care? Well, one question I think, Bettina, that might apply to the nursing home population. Um, uh, there are increasing data uh, or uh, uh, probes and other approaches to be able to surveil populations, particularly older, older adult populations, to measure um, activity, to measure overall function, um, uh, wearables, uh, and, and other a variety of other probes, uh, as well as um, uh, measurement of voice, uh, which have started to enable us to think more clearly about diagnosis. Um, how much do you think that that will help us in terms of designing new approaches to care, particularly among uh, disabled older adult populations? Uh, this is a very important question, but it's difficult to give a clear answer on this, because when we get all this data, we have to process and analyze and interpret this data. And we do not know enough where are the cut points between pathological data and normal data. And we have to, use, we have to work more with visualization of this data and with uh, some kind of decision making. What does this data mean? 
uh, and um, uh, uh, in Norway, actually, no, we rely a lot of uh, registries because we have huge uh, health registries. Every person in Norway is registered in some kind of registries. So there are a lot of data we uh, actually can use. For instance, we um, uh, analyzed data regarding where are Norwegian people dying when. And we only included uh, 100,000 people to analyze this data. And we saw that um, um, people in the end of life uh, moved from at home to the hospital, to the nursing home, and back to home, and back to hospital in the, only the last three months of their life. And this is a guarantee for undignified um, uh, treatment. And I know that these people do not want to be sent to all these different places, and this is really costly. So, but the analysis using registries is very time consuming. So we are very happy when in future such type of digital phenotyping or real world data are available. But actually now in Norway we do not have really this environment to collect the data, send them, visualize, visualize these data, make our decision, go into the nursing home, go at home and do our actions. So this is a lot of work um, in advance. Uh, the, we, we mentioned before um, about all of our collective confidence uh, around older adults and their ability to use digital devices uh, and that many more are um, less resistant adopters than uh, I think we hypothesize uh, from our own ages view. Uh, are there approaches that any of you have taken uh, around digital literacy um, that you found um, more accommodating, more empathic, and more helpful in being able to bring the use of technologies um, uh, to older adult populations. And are there any uh, activities or policy-related activities, uh, uh, Keith, in this regard that the Alzheimer's Association might be working on as well? I'm not aware of um, any policy activities around that. I, I don't, th I mean, as you mentioned, I, I think we're all fairly confident up here that it's not really that big of a problem, that, that um, you know, there is adoption of these technologies fairly widely among older adults, um, so. I just want to say, in the Center for Aging that I formerly ran up at Dartmouth, one of the most fun things we had was we had high school students and junior high students sitting next to older adults in this tech coaching experience. And it was a wonderful volunteer activity for the young individuals. The older individuals just loved the interaction. And I overheard heard some wonderful conversations where one woman said, well, young man, what do you want to do when you grow up? And she said, I'd like to be a CEO. And she said, oh, I was one. And he, his eyes popped out of his head. You know, she was a 90-year-old woman. And they started having this wonderful conversation. Also had another interesting over, thing that I overheard where uh, this uh, woman was saying to this young student, uh, you know, what's this cut and paste thing? I don't get it. She said, well, think about when you were in class and you couldn't remember what the answer was to the test score and you looked over at the paper next to you, you put it up in your head and you put it down on the paper. She said, that's cheating. She said, well, I would never do that, but that's cut and paste. So, but, but it really was, and it was an extraordinary intergenerational opportunity for people who are just so adept with this technology to give back to seniors and seniors and turn to deal with them individually, and that was really kind of a heartfelt way to do it. I'm sure there's much more disembodied and technically wonderful use of avatars and other sorts of things, but this was really a, a true a blending of the generations around something that they wanted to learn together. And were you able to create any curriculum for the young people to use, or at least give them a scaffolding as to the kinds of skills they might be able to convey? We had a wonderful coach, actually somebody who sat down with them and actually helped. We didn't put, put down a, a, write down a curriculum, but we actually had everybody go through a coaching experience or about how to work with an older adult and how to be patient and how to kind of communicate and, and, and how to learn from those older adults right. and what sorts of things you might want to use as curbside consults about your own life that you can get from these people with wisdom. I mean, it was really wonderful. Tony? And we've gotten off easy because from the patient perspective with our tests, they're just drawing a picture with a pen. It, the, it's a ballpoint pen. It writes just like any other pen. So it really doesn't feel like technology. 
and so people just pick it right up, go right for it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the pen is a little bit wider than a normal pen, and older individuals like that, if they have arthritis, it's like, oh, this is much easier to hold. So, so given that you have digitized the response and the analytics, what kind of feedback uh, are you able to give people about their performance on the test and what it might mean neuropsychologically in terms of their own uh, overall function, given that you have a more special way than the analog approach we usually try to respond to people? Yeah, so it would definitely be the physician communicating with the patient. Um, it would be the physician seeing the test results. And uh, it's, it's definitely designed to be a cognitive screener. So it's, it's not diagnosing anything. It's looking at how the patient is performing against our normative databases in terms of you know, their cognitive health. And so the physician would then have a, car a conversation with the patient uh, deciding whether any sort of follow-up testing is warranted. But it's not intended for that report to be given to the patient, you know, independent of a physician. The, the last question, which I'm really not sure, I, I, you don't have to answer. The question is, you know, uh, as we start to accumulate these data, they're going to allow us to risk stratify to a greater extent, to better understand each of the specific populations. And how much do you think that will contribute to our improving the specificity of our nosology? Um, uh, and starting to create a higher degree of diagnostic specificity as we stratify patient populations and therefore under understand the specific uh, approaches to care. My guess is that that's going to be a conversation that we'll have all day for the next couple of days, um, particularly in a, in a psychiatric context. But any of you have any thoughts uh, uh, that might want to stimulate later conversations? It's the great hope, right? Uh, uh, Population-based precision medicine that actually is able to bring together genetic, epigenetic data, digital phenotypes, and actually make some sense out of that targeting care for individuals who are all different, rather than these crude studies we do around looking at median or mean outcomes for interventions and randomized trials, which actually make no sense, really, if you think about it. We're, none of us are average. None of us are means. So how to do that is, I think, the great hope, right? Well, I, I want to thank all of you for really the exciting work that you're doing the advocacy you're doing to try to change our field, the approaches that you're taking to innovate and try to solve problems that have been conundrum for long periods of time, but with the growing older adult populations are problems that society better face. Um, I, and uh, as I suggested before, as we were talking about the life expectancy uh, associated uh, with severe mental illness, at the end of the day, the quality of this healthcare system and our science will be judged by the way in which we provide care for those of greatest need and those with the most complex problems. Um, uh, and therefore, having you all work in these areas with both advocacy as well as science and the translation of new ideas to approaches that are more effective and more efficient is extremely important and critically, uh, I think, a gift to our field. So thank you very much.